All right. Um, so, hi, everybody. I am Neha and uh, for those of you who do not know me, I work on the radars team. Today, I'm going to try to give a good walkthrough on recovery, particularly focusing on uh, asynchronous recovery that we implemented uh, for Mimic. And before I delve into the code, I just thought it would be helpful for everybody. Let me just quickly share my screen. All right, can can you see my screen, everybody? Yeah, looks good. All right, I'm just going to go over a couple of, I know slides are boring, but I still want to just go over a couple of them um, because I think it makes more sense and gives background about why we wanted async recovery in the first place. Um, so the motivation behind uh, async recovery is that recovery in Ceph has been a synchronous process, which implies that it blocked writes to an object which was pending uh, recovery. So the problem obviously with this is that it increases write latencies and affects the availability in total. So we wanted to get rid of this problem. And the solution that we came up with was not to block writes on objects which are only missing on non-acting OSDs. So I want to uh, focus on the fact that the whole idea of async recovery takes a lot from backfill, which is already a concept present in Ceph. So um, the idea is to perform recovery in the background of an OSD out of the acting set, just like backfill, and use the PG log to determine what needs recovery. And this is uh, one of the most important slides, I think. We are going to see these concepts in the code as well, but it's just important to remember that these are the three factors that determine when we perform async recovery. So as I mentioned earlier, that async recovery targets are OSDs that are just taken out of the acting set based on these following conditions. So we use uh, this magnitude of the, the approximate magnitude and the difference of the logs as a new parameter by which we judge the cost of recovery on a particular object. And async recovery targets have higher cost to recover, and that's why we uh, remove them and do not block on the recovery of those objects, thereby also reducing the overall cost of recovery. Uh, the next thing is that we have introduced this parameter called OSD async recovery min PG log entries, and the default is 100 for now. This basically determines that as long as the cost to recover is greater than this threshold, we are allowed to perform async recovery. Now, we can always tune this parameter and use it to our benefit and perform experiments to determine what is a good value for it, but we just now have the hook uh, to change this parameter and allow uh, users to decide what they want this value to be. But for now, we have set it to 100. And the third one, which is the most important one, I feel, is we always want to maintain min size replicas. As long as we have this, that is when we even can think of performing async recovery. If we do not have min size replicas available, we cannot perform async recovery. All right, so how does this work? And for this, we go to the code. Just. Can you guys uh, see my terminal now? Yeah. Oh, okay. Before I talk about how all this stuff works, the most important pieces of code uh, lie in the OSD directory, and the files of interest to us are pg.h, pg.cc, primary log pg.h, cc, and uh, a little bit of pg backend.hcc and also the backend specific uh, implementations are in uh, replicated pg.cc and ec backend.cc i think this these are mostly the important files where you'll see all the latest changes that have uh, been implemented so let's now first go into pg.cc
So uh, when I spoke about selecting some OSDs as async recovery targets, so this whole thing happens in the choose acting function. So this is a function which was already there, and and as as there's a clear comment about what it does, it calculates the desired acting set and uh, requests a change with the monitor if it differs from the current acting set. A byproduct of this function is also that while we select the acting set, it used to segregate out backfill targets in the process, and we will take a look at how it was doing it. What we have done recently is we have also changed it to segregate out async recovery targets as another byproduct of this um, function. So if you look at it, it takes in, I think it's important that we focus on this function a bit uh, because this is where all, all, all the things happen. And then we can see how, like after we select async recovery targets, what next? How does it actually ensure that we uh, do not block uh, IO to that object? So coming back to choose acting. So this is a function in pg.cc and it takes in the authoritative log shard ID, a, a couple of other things which are not important right away. So let's just go down. It does its job of trying to select acting OSDs. I am now going to focus on this part. So if you look at this section, you see a calc replicated acting and a calc EC acting function. So these two functions basically select acting OSDs and also select backfill targets out of the entire set of OSDs that we provide to this function. So the parameters that we pass here are uh, the auth log shard, the PG size, the acting set, the up, up primary. And the important bit here is that we have a want variable, a want backfill, and want acting backfill. These are the three that get populated as uh, a result of this function. Let's, for simplicity, let's just look at the replicator function. There's a nice comment here which also says what this function does. It calculates the desired acting set and uh, based, on a, based on certain criteria that we already have defined. Now, keep going. This is a process by which we are just saying that, okay, first we are going to choose up OSDs, and then we are going to use some criteria to say, okay, if the log has continuity with the primary, then we prefer those uh, OSDs as acting OSDs. But what I am going to focus here on is, this is where we are also saying that if, and we are iterating over the up OSDs and checking that if the current info of the OSD that we are looking at is incomplete and also, or the last update on that OSD is less than the oldest authoritative log entry, then we are going to select this OSD as a backfill target. So this is the place where we are segregating out backfill OSDs based on this particular condition. And we pretty much do this, and by the end of this function, we have three, let me just go back, yeah. So we have these filled out, the want set, which is going to be the proposed acting set, the want backfill, which is the backfill targets, and want acting backfill is a combination of both. After this, we, okay. So when I kept saying proposed, we, I meant that, there is this function here which checks whether after making these selections, can we still recover and are we greater than or equal to min size or not? This is exactly the name determines what the function does. So I'm not going to go into the details of the function. If that condition is not met, we just terminate the function and we return false and whatever we have done uh, till this point, is not going to be used because we, as I mentioned, we always need to maintain min size uh, replicas. 
Now we come to the part what has been implemented new for async recovery. So the output or the outcome of the calc EC and calc replicated um, functions are now passed to these two new functions. One is called uh, choose async recovery EC and the other is the replicated one. And if you look at it, we just pass the want set that was returned earlier. And we are also expecting that this want async recovery set gets populated if there is a chance of OSDs getting selected as async recovery targets. Now let's again go and see what choose async recovery replicated does. So we already know what this function takes in. What, uh, so the idea here is we are going to create a set which is a pair of an int and a pg shard t. So this int is basically the cost to recover for a particular shard. So the first bullet that I mentioned in the slide maps to this. Now I'm going to talk about how we populate this. Even before we can populate uh, the set, we first try to eliminate any stray OSDs and any OSDs that are not up. So we found that in, if we end up selecting any of these kind of OSDs, it becomes hard for the OSD to get back into the acting set. And then uh, we, we can't basically recover that PG completely. So we just ensure that if these two conditions are met, we will not select such OSDs as async recovery targets. If we are well and good so far, what we try to do is, there are two versions that we find out. So one is the auth info last update version, which is the version of the authoritative uh, log and the candidate version. So when we are looping through uh, these OSDs, we check the last update version of that particular OSDs PG log. And uh, we try to find the difference in with, which is what we call the approx entries, the auth version minus the candidate version. This is the cost to recover. Now, once we have this cost, what we check is whether this cost, so this is coming to the second bullet that I mentioned earlier. Um, if this cost is greater than OSD async recovery min PG log entries, which was 100 in our case, that is when we end up selecting or even considering that OSD for async recovery. And we insert it in this set called uh, candidates by cost. So by the end, when this function terminates, we have a new uh, set which has the cost to recover and uh, the shard in, in, in it. After this, what we do is we are going to ensure that we take out OSDs which have a higher cost to recover. But this condition here ensures that we do not go below min size. So we keep checking that our want set, which is going to be our acting set is always uh, less than or equal to min size of the of the pool. As long as that is met, we can go ahead and we can insert the OST in the async recovery um, set that we asked it to populate earlier. So this is pretty much the idea of how we select async recovery uh, targets. And by the end of this function, what we have is some more OSDs that have been segregated out of the one set as async recovery targets. Beyond this, we uh, do pretty much what we used to do earlier. Uh, to, to, uh, we request a change if the want is not equal to the acting. And by the end of it, we will see that we have our backfill targets, our new want set, yeah, this is where we have, we have the new backfill targets, the async recovery targets, and we also have the want, uh, we call it want acting backfill now, um, which, which is just basic, uh, sorry, it's like acting recovery backfill because we've, it now is catering to both recovery and backfill. So after this, what is important to focus on? Okay. So I spoke about uh, the part where we have already selected some OSDs on which if there are objects uh, which are not uh, recovered yet, we can still afford to do IO and not block on them. 
Now I'm going to talk about where we implement this part of not blocking the IO. So that goes into a uh, primary log.cc. In primary log.cc, there's this function called do op where any op starts getting processed. So it just gets the op reference. It does a bunch of checks that I'm not going to go into details about, but I'm just going to go to the part where um, we earlier used to block saying that if an object is degraded, then we will not process IO to it and we will first try to recover it. There are a lot of checks that we're doing here, but the important one, all right. Big. Okay, this is the function that basically decides is degraded or backfilling object. And if it is, then it kicks recovery and just returns early from this function. Now, I'm going to just quickly go over this function. What we have done is we have changed this function a bit. And we say that if an object is only missing on an async recovery target, then this function is not going to return true. How we do it is here you can see we iterate over all the acting recovery backfill uh, shards and we try to find it in the pure missing set. So uh, before I even go into what pure missing, so pure missing is another data structure uh, that stores and all the information about missing objects on a particular peer. A peer means an OSD. It has all the information of, of the objects that it, it is missing and the versions that it is missing and all the information that is required for it to recover later. So it tries to find uh, that particular uh, peer in the peer missing set. And when it finds that it, there is an entry in the peer missing set for that uh, peer and it checks that if that peer is an async recovery target, then it just continues. It lets um, it, it lets this function proceed further. And at, at the end, if it doesn't find anything, we, it returns false. So basically, this will hold true. And uh, when if the object is only missing on an async recovery target, then this will return false in that condition. So that's how we ended up bypassing this function. And now we can go ahead and do the rest of the things here that are mentioned. Should just go to the important. Once we have done all the checks, it now goes to execute CTX where we execute the context of the op that has just uh, come in for processing. So just doing a quick recap of we now have async recovery targets. We now know that we are not blocking on an async recovery target, but we also need to ensure that we have adequate information about that particular object uh, in the peer missing set of the of the primary, first in the primary, to uh, eventually recover this particular object. So we need to uh, do some extra uh, work to update the peer missing sets for uh, th that object. So let us see where we do that. So we have this function called issue rep op. So as the name suggests, this is a function that issues the rep op and does a bunch of work which helps in issuing the rep op. If we go further into it. What I've changed in this function is right here. So uh, at this point, we are trying to uh, ensure that uh, uh, there is no log operation that has happened so far, but we know that the, the we have enough information about the log entry that is getting processed. So we are now going to check uh, 
we iterate over all the async recovery targets and we check whether the pure missing set has that entry of that object and is missing that particular uh, object. So it's basically saying that, is it an async recovery target? Yes. And is it missing that particular object? Yes. Then what we do is we do go ahead and update this pure missing set. So this add next event is something that I should talk about. I think it is in the Add next event just takes in the log entry, tries to find that object for that log entry in the missing set, and goes and this is the actual part that it does. So this is the missing set. It creates an entry of that object and adds an item with the current version of the log. And since this is saying that it's a new element, so it's it's like a need version, the have version, and whether this uh, object is a delete or not. So these three pieces of information get stored in the missing set. So when we wanted to update the uh, when we said peer missing add next event we now have added information about that particular object in the peer missing set of the peer now let's see what we are doing next so uh, similar to peer missing we also have this missing lock dot add missing this is again uh, a function uh, this is again a data structure which goes and updates uh, there's a needs recovery map which goes and adds this entry in the needs recovery map. I'm not going to go into too much detail. It's a little complicated there, but the idea is to basically ensure that all the data structures that we require uh, to recover are up to date about this particular object and the log entry. So it basically updates the object, the, the version it is at, and the, need, the have version is empty and it's a delete or not is the information that we store. Now, moving ahead, uh, so there's, okay, this might sound confusing, but there's another data structure called missing lock, which is kind of the opposite. So missing lock is a data structure which has correct information about a particular object. So it has the information about all the OSDs that have up-to-date information about a particular object. So when we are trying to update the missing information, we also iterate through the acting set. So the acting set is where we are sure that all the information is up to date. And we go ahead and update the missing lock add location about that particular object and all the peers that have add right information about that object. Finally, we are at the end of this function. Okay, so before we terminate, we just go and call a submit transaction and we send it all this information the object id the stats the version a bunch of other information here we'll see how we use this later since this is getting called on the pg backend now we need to uh, go and see backend specific code so for simplicity again i'm going to go to just uh, the replicated case and see how this works Okay, so in submit transaction, we do a few things which are just specific to uh, uh, executing that operation. And the important bit here is this generate transaction. There are a couple of indirections here, but in each function, we end up doing some more incremental amount of work that is required for processing the op. So there is nothing specific to async recovery in this function. So I'm just going to go to generate transaction. Um, in generate transaction, we, I think, end up calling. It's called issue op. Yeah, so we end up calling issue op. So all the information that we received earlier, we end up passing to issue op and let's now see what issue op does okay so um, it 
tries to encode the log entries. It goes through all the acting recovery backfill sets and individually calls a generate sub op uh, function on each of them. So this message write is what is going to get populated when generate sub op returns. And to generate the sub op, we again pass in all the information that it requires to generate that sub op. This is where we will see changes that were made for async recovery. We come in here. We are just trying to create, so the MOSD rep op is a, a replica op that we are trying to create here using all the information that we have, we pass to this function. But the important bit is this. So there's this uh, check that we are doing that if parent should send op, if it returns false, then we just create an empty transaction and encode it into get data. But if should, it, uh, should send op is true, then we have actual op transaction. This op underscore t is what we got in here, is what we pass in, uh, which we en what we encode into uh, get data. Now, this should send op is where we determine Let's just go and see. So that's again in primary log.cc. So should send op is where we decide whether we should send uh, a, the complete op or only the log entries of, to that particular uh, OSD. So if you look at it, it's a pretty simple function. It just takes the peer and the object. Now, it first checks whether the peer is a primary. If it is a primary, we always send uh, the complete op, so there's no question about not sending the op. If not, then we go ahead and first check for backfill targets. So this was already there, and we select, we checked whether uh, these two conditions. So it's the object ID is uh, beyond the last backfill started. Then we know that it is a backfill target, and we send we say that issue uh, rep op is going to just empty an empty op transaction to that particular OSD. What we have also made this function do is to check for async recovery targets. So we check first that the peer that we are trying to send this op is that peer an async recovery target or not. So when this function, uh, so when this uh, when we find out that it is we next try to check whether that object is missing on that particular peer or not. If both these conditions are true, then we say that we are just going to ship an empty op transaction to that uh, OSD. So this is how we are allowing the write to go through, but we are not sending uh, a complete op uh, to, that, to the backend. So let's just go here and see. So this is where we are using the return value for should send up. And based on that, we are updating, as I mentioned earlier, encoding the empty transaction or uh, the op underscore tree transaction. Beyond this, we are just doing, uh, we're just filling in other information that will be required for us to send to the replicas. and we just return the right. So I think with this, we have ensured that we have updated all the data structures on the primary. We have ensured that we send the right kind of information to the replica for it to also determine that it's, it's an op that is getting proce processed on an uh, async recovery target. So. Next, I think what I'm going to talk about is how the replica realizes what it should do or how, like, it also has a role of updating its missing data structures and identifying that it itself is an async recovery target or not. So let me just go and show you where that happens. So, yeah. So whenever uh, an op comes through, handle message is going to check whether that op message that came in is of the type OSD uh, rep op, which is a replica op, and it ends up calling do rep op and sends the op to it. 
So let's see the implementation of this function. So this is trying to extract information of, from that op and trying to process the op that has been just sent. But what I'm trying to focus here is on this. So if you see, there is a D out here, which has been added due to async recovery. I'm just, I'm, I'm just gonna focus on what this is saying. This says that I'm a replica, get my log, get my missing set and see what the items are. So it's just saying, what are the missing items that I have is what it is printing. It's just added for debugging purposes, but this is the data, this is the data structure that we end up updating for async recovery. So let's go and see where we do that. So this is a new flag that we have added, but uh, that's not really important. What we try to do is we try to, to PG missing tracker underscore T P missing is going to get all the uh, local missing objects for that particular uh, peer. So now it may be an async recovery target or not, we don't know yet. But when we check this P missing, is missing object ID. So if that missing set is missing that particular object, that means we know that it is an async recovery target and we set async true. And what we try to do here is we try to update some information. So add local next event. So let's go and see what this function does. Add local what it does is again it's another indirection it just says missing add next entry now missing add next entry is now let me say it's in pg log dot h okay missing add next entry what this is again saying is add next event so if you remember we did an add next event earlier for the primary case as well when we said that add next event is going to go and update uh it's going to take this log entry it's going to find out what object we are trying to uh, update and it's going to update the missing sets for it which was i can go back to it yeah so it does the same thing for the replica now it goes and updates this missing set for that uh, object and updates all the information for its own uh, log so th this is where yes so this is where we have ensured that all the information is up to date about the missing sets on the async recovery targets so what this helps us is it helps us do log-based recovery. All the information, all the missing set is there. So when log-based recovery is going to happen, it is going to get all the right kind of information that it requires to recover uh, that particular PG. Before I go to the next part, let me, I know the EC part may be a little complicated, but I will try to go do a little bit of it and show you parallels between both of so the should send op function is also used by EC backend. And if you see here, should send op is populating a should send a variable. So uh, EC sub write is pretty much like a, a, like a rep op that we did. EC sub write is parallel of that. So when we create this sub write op, we in, we send this should send information with it. So let me now show you how. Handle sub write is again a parallel of uh, do rep op do replication so handle subwrite performs similar functions to that function here what we see is we check if the op 
is backfill or async recovery. And okay, so it's pretty much doing the same thing. It checks whether this is a backfill or an async recovery target, and it sends the empty transaction. So it ensures that it doesn't write the whole transaction, it just writes the log entries. The next part is, yeah, so if you look at it, these lines of code are pretty much exactly the same that we did uh, for uh, the replicated case. So it's just going to get the local missing for that EC shard, and it's going to see if it is a missing object. If it is, then it goes and calls add local next event on that particular log entry. And this is pretty much what we need to know about how the backend specific implementation of async recovery is. I think uh, the next thing I would like to go into would be uh, PG dot. Okay. So now let's just jump to the part where, let us say, log-based recovery has completed. And we also need to ensure that these OSDs that we selected as async recovery targets should become or get a chance to become like a regular acting OSD when all those conditions that I mentioned earlier are not true. I mean, that it is not missing any object um, and it has all the up-to-date information. So that happens basically in, so this is called when the PG has recovered and it, you can see that it is trying to get into uh, the started primary active in the recovered state. So here we make another call to choose acting and we ensure at this point we know that it does not need recovery anymore because we are asserting that PG needs recovery is uh, false. And we make these extra calls to choose acting to allow it to go and empty out async recovery targets if we don't need them anymore. Or, or like maybe select some other OSDs as async recovery targets because uh, they are better candidates for async recovery. This is where before we actually go to the recovered state, we make another call to choose acting and we ensure that the OSDs uh, that were earlier selected as async recovery targets can get back to the acting set. So I think with this, I have mostly covered how async recovery works in general. What I would like to uh, understand here is maybe I'll stop sharing my screen screen and also the other when we spoke about going through the recovery code the recovery code on its own is pretty deep and i don't think it can be covered in uh, in a in an hour so what i have a suggestion is to also go and uh, cover a bit of recovery improvements that we've done uh, in, i think with luminous where we allowed recovery ops to be uh, throttled. That's something I worked on and I'm very familiar with, so it could just make sense for me to go over that part of the code as well. So is, is everybody okay with that? Or, or we can also do more questions about async recovery at this point. Yeah, that seems like a good idea. Um, maybe just uh, related to that, going through um, where the recovery ops gets get kicked off. Yep, yep, sure, sure. Okay, cool. So let me go back to just sharing my... Uh, recovery on a particular OSD basically begins uh, using this do recovery function, which is called using PG recovery. PG recovery is the P recovery class and run is the function that we basically call to 
start recovery on uh, to start a particular recovery op. So we just go and say OSD do recovery on this particular PG and we pass in a few other things that it requires for recovery. Now let's go and see what do recovery does. This is this comment. Okay, so this comment kind of explains what uh, the OSD recovery sleep option is for. So this is uh, the option that I was talking about that helps you throttle recovery ops uh, based on your requirement. So let's, as the comment explains pretty clearly, that when the value of this uh, OSD recovery sleep is greater than zero recovery ops are scheduled after this much amount of time uh, from the previous previous recovery op. So how this is implemented is what I'm going to focus on. So this get recovery sleep function is another thing we might want to talk about. So what this does is it just says that if we have this value in our CEFCONF OSD recovery sleep, then we just use that value as the sleep value for recovery. But if not, what we can also end up doing is checking whether the store is rotational and the journal is rotational. If both are not rotational, that means we have both of them on SSDs. So we use a different value, which is OSD recovery sleep SSD, which we determined after doing a bunch of experiments. I think it's set to some point zero to five or something like that. Uh, but we basically say that we are going to use a separate throttling sleep value if the backends are both on uh, SSDs. And similarly, we also have this hybrid option, which says that if the store is rotational and the journal is not, then we use this different value. Now, all these have different uh, values that we have configured for now, but I'm pretty sure these can be changed or we can improve these values uh, with time. So once we have this value and this value is non-zero, then we go ahead and check for this. So recovery needs sleep is another flag that we have, which we set to true when we want uh, recovery sleep to happen. So now what we do here is, this is the important bit. So recovery requeue callback. So at this point, what we are doing is we're just creating or defining a callback. We're not actually calling the callback. We're defining a callback and we're saying that when this callback is going to get executed, uh, do recovery is going to wake up at a particular time and requeue recovery ops. And what it ends up doing is taking a sleep lock that we have defined and since it has already slept at that time, we set this recovery needs sleep uh, variable to false. We call recovery, uh, queue recovery after sleep, and we pass it the PG reference and all the information that we already, got, that do recovery got. Now let's move and see what this does. Now that we have the callback defined, what we now need to, we need to actually determine what the recovery schedule time is going to be, that when is the next recovery op uh, going to happen. So recovery sleep time based on what the time now is. If we do not have a schedule time earlier, we just start from now. But if we do have a recovery schedule time earlier, then we just add recovery sleep amount of time to the previous time and uh, schedule the next recovery op. Now we know what callback to execute and when to execute. So we add this event in the sleep timer saying that this is the schedule time and this is the callback it needs to execute when, um, when it is time for it to do so. This is what ensures, this, this is the part we ensure that we do not block, this is also an asynchronous operation uh, we do not block while we are uh, sleeping. So it's basically going and adding events and whenever there is, whenever it is time for it to execute it, it is going to go and execute uh, that callback. 
beyond this, when this completes, we have two recovery starting. This is the function start recovery ops. That's where we start all the recovery ops when all these conditions are true and we can actually go and proceed and do a uh, recovery. So maybe we can just look at what start recovery ops does. So now this is again called on the PG. So the code is going to be somewhere, I think it should be. Yes, it is in primary pg.cc. See what this function does. So it has a few variables called work in progress, recovery start. So these are just used to uh, to keep track of the state in which this, these uh, recovery ops are. And as the name suggests, if recovery has started, then work in progress is going to be uh, just true. These the, these are basically for tracking um, and ensuring that we don't keep calling the same function again and again as long as one recovery op has been queued. Uh, after that, we are going to just check. Okay, so the recovery op is going to be uh, started on the primary. So we are just asserting that whether we are a primary or not, have we paired or not and we are not deleting. So the, we need to check all these before we go and start any recovery operations. Okay, after this, there's a state test that we do and we just say that if we are not in the recovering or the backfilling state, that means we have recovery has raced and we've still called this function. That means we are racing and we are calling it up. So we are just, we're going to ignore that case. Moving on, okay. So we've been looking at this get missing, uh, so the data structures that we were trying to update for async recovery. So this is basically doing the same thing. It's trying to look for the primary PG log. It's calling a get missing function on it, and it's trying to get the missing set uh, for that particular uh, OSD, the primary basically. It's trying to do missing dot num missing. So it's basically trying to see how many missing objects are there. And it is also trying to find how many unfound are there. Uh, the next thing we check is if the number of missing are zero, that means we are all up to date, then we can go ahead and say that the last complete and the last update on that particular uh, pair is the same. That means we, we are not missing any information. So we can just say our last complete is the last update. But what if that is not true? Let's see what happens. So if num missing is num unfound. So basically we're just saying that all the missing are basically unfound objects. Then we go ahead and say that we are going to uh, recover the replicas. But I'm, before we go and look at what re recover replicas does, I'm also going to just go ahead in this code and see. So here, this, this is the first chance where we go and try to recover replicas. And the started variable basically determines whether we have uh, started recovery on the replicas or not. If not, then what we try to do is that we try to recover the primary. The, because it just says, as the comment mentions, that we still have missing objects that we should grab from replicas. So we will now make an attempt because it has not started recovery on the replicas. We will try to recover the primary. If that is also not true, we go and do this. So this says that if we have not started recovery, that means this condition was not uh, fulfilled and num unfound is not equal to get num unfound, so which was the earlier thing that we found here. Num unfound is the get num unfound. So in the meantime, we have changed the state of the missing sets. And that's why we want to go and recover the replicas again. So now let's go and see what recover replicas does. Okay. 
fixed in the maximum recovery ops that it can process the, the handle and work started is again another variable that determines whether uh, we have started any recovery uh, work or not. PG backend, it just opens a recovery op, it, it returns a recovery handle. And next thing that we do is we check whether, so acting recovery backfill, as I mentioned earlier, it's basically uh, all the acting OSDs, recovering OSDs, and like the, the recovering means the asyncly recovering OSDs and the backfill targets. We check whether this uh, is, we have to ensure that this is not empty because if there is any recovery pending, this uh, set will not be empty. So we just double check that before we go ahead and do any work. So, this is another vector that we try to populate, and we say that we are going to uh, segregate out all the replicas along with the number of missing objects on them. That's what this whole code block is going to do. So we try to find that particular peer in peer missing, and we ensure that we are not at the end of the peer missing set. So NM should be the num missing on that particular peer, and it tries to append or sorry, push back as a pair, the number of missing and that particular set. It's, it's similar to the function candidates by cost where we had the cost and the OSD that we were trying to add to a set. It's just doing it for the as number of missing and the pair. Next, what we do is um, we sort this based on missing objects in ascending order. So we know which pairs are missing more number of objects. Once we do that, let's see what we do here, okay. So we are going to iterate over uh, all the replicas that are there in the replicas by missing um, that. And we are first going to say, uh, we are going to, okay, so peer is basically the second item in the set, so it's just going to, get the shard as a pair and it's going to assert that I'm not a primary because we are now doing recover replicas so a replica cannot be a primary so it's just doing another extra check for that. Here what we do is we find that particular pair in the pair missing set and we ensure that that entry is present in the pair missing set and once we get that entry we find the same peer in peer info. So peer info is another data structure that we maintain for uh, all the peers, which has, which is basically, if you look at it, um, it's a mapping of the shard and the PG info uh, for that particular uh, peer. Again, we need to ensure that there is an entry for that peer in peer info as well. And once all this is met, what we do is we try to get the num missing for that particular uh, pair, which is M size, I guess, S it is. So here we are just printing out the objects and the, okay, this is the size of the object and these are the actual objects that we are printing out. We are just going to say that we are good to recover the oldest first. So if we go here, we are iterating over the missing set in the reverse order, which is the R missing. And we are just checking for a bunch of things again here. So let's see what we're checking here. We are checking whether the object is, so missing lock is again the data structure I talked about. So you can go make a call to that function and find out whether it is an unfound object or not. If it is an unfound object, we just say it is unfound and we can't recover it right away, so we continue. Next, what we do is we check whether this object is past last backfill or not. So if that is the case, then if it is not present in the recovery, okay, 
So it's basically going to check whether it's passed backfill or not. That means we do not need to do backfill on it. It needs to go through the recovery code path. And at this point, we know that it is not in the rec so recovering is another data structure where we store all the objects that are getting recovered. So we, we if we don't find that object in that recovering set, we error out and say that the object is beyond last backfill and object uh, added to the ambassador, but no, okay. So it's been added to the backfill set, but it is not recovering it. And that's an error condition. But if we do find uh, it in the recovering uh, count, that means we know that this object is already recovering and we don't need to perform recover recovery again. So we just continue again. And let's see what this does. Okay. Now we, uh, before doing the recovery, we need to check whether that object has been deleted or not. If the object has been deleted, we use this function called prep object replica deletes to do recovery. And it's a little different from uh, of this another function called prep obj uh, object replica pushes, where we actually try to push all the updated information to uh, uh, for that object. But when it is a delete, we just need to ensure that we delete it from all the other uh, replicas. So. That's that's why we have a different function for deleted uh, objects. Then there are again a bunch of other checks that we do. And this is what the important part is. This is where we actually send the object. The need object, uh, the, the need version of that object, the handle, the recovery handle and the work started variable, which is again going to go and penetrate one down um, like one other level and just going to inform us whether prep uh, object replica pushes has started any work for the replica recovery or not. Right. I think we are out of time, but I mean, how do we want to go about it? I mean, I, the, there's a whole, uh, there's a lot of code that we, if we want to go through uh, the re, this prep object pushes, then there is start recovery and there's like a bunch of other things that we can go through. So how do we want to do it? Do we want to do it like as a part of a separate talk or uh, um, I, I think it cannot be covered uh, in like five to 10 more minutes. Yeah, I'll save those for a separate talk because, like, like you said, it gets pretty complex there. It um, is pretty complex there, and I think we, uh, it's better to, yeah, I think it'll be helpful for everybody if we have like a, a diagrammatic representation of how things work because there, it's it's a little complicated in there. Yeah, it'd be good to have a high level overview before just yep. diving into the code for sure. Yeah. Well, okay. I guess we are done here then. And yeah, if, if there are any questions, if there are any questions, feel free to ask them now or just send me an email or uh, me an IRC. I'm um, willing to answer all your queries. I have a I have a question. Yep. Um, I think I missed at the beginning maybe like some of the details about the goals of async recovery, or maybe we just like went through the slides really fast. So it, I got the impression that one of the goals was to uh, allow the cluster to accept writes for objects mm -hmm. that are degraded, but or that are being recovered. Is that is that true? Yes. Yeah, so we okay. the idea is that we are not going to block if those objects are only on async recovery targets. So, so I guess we, we so so the the idea is that since async recovery targets are not part of the acting set, so we can still afford uh, to write to them and not have up to date copies on them because they are not part of the acting set. So they will not participate in like immediately not immediately participate in uh, returning the right information about those objects. So we can. If like delay recovery on those objects uh, using async recovery. 
I, th I think that the, maybe the key thing I'm thinking of is like when you're accepting rights for objects that are being recovered, you're still applying those rights to like the primary and some of the replicas. You're not like doing something fancy where you're logging the like journaling rights and then like replicating the journal or like it's it's something else, right? Mm -hmm. it's, it's, okay. it's yeah, yeah. It's it's that's not like it's the regular process that we use. So okay. For, okay. So, and and uh, the thing to notice is there is that if there is an object that's missing on a, not uh, on an async recovery target, we'll still go ahead and do synchronous recovery in that case. Okay. Yeah, that makes that makes sense. I think there was just something that I was confused about at the beginning, but that's that clarifies it. Thanks. Cool. Any any more questions, or are we done here? All right, so, okay, feel free uh, for those of you who are going to look at the video later on as well, just feel free to reach out to me if you have more questions. And uh, I guess have a good day, good evening, uh, wherever you are. Thank you. Thanks, Dale.